other day, we had work to put the K100 back behind my house into its cocoon so it can eventually grow into something a little bit more pretty. We went for a ride later that night after I retrieved my FC1 and I realized how much I missed riding a bike that works 100% with no issues whatsoever. But also, after riding a bike that isn't really gonna win any land speed records in the form of the K100, it honestly felt ridiculous to jump on a bike as fast as the FC1 because <laughs> the difference becomes extremely apparent in every single way. Holy shit, this bike is fast. Oh, I forgot, man. It's been like almost two weeks. This bike is, why do I have this bike? Yo, this bike is fucking stupid. This thing is a rocket ship. I have a mirror, look at that. I have a mirror right now. You don't understand how, how much better of a bike this feels like. No! I was getting acquainted with my own bike. I wanna ride yours. This video is gonna be a quick and simple rundown of all the things that I like the most about the bikes that I've owned in the past and miss the most to this day. And this is all by request of a viewer of the channel. I was actually thinking about this for several reasons. The first one being a little story that I just mentioned about getting back on the FZ1, and the second one being a more recurring phenomenon where every time I cover a certain bike in videos, I get a few people commenting about how they missed their example of the bike and how they wish that there was a way that they didn't have to sell it. And I can relate to that, thus making me realize that every biker would ideally own at least five bikes if there were a way to do so with zero drawbacks financially, spatially, and practically. Look, I'll admit that I'm one of those sentimental fucks, but that comes along with the mindset of seeing an inherent use in everything. I'm not a hoarder or anything, but you know, I know the regret of getting rid of certain things, which is an aspect of my personality that's constantly at odds with my pragmatic approach to life, which is more or less concerned with what is bringing joy right now, rather than what has potential to bring joy in the future. Maybe I have a problem and soon I'll be tearing myself apart. But for obvious reasons, we can start with the 1986 Honda Rebel 250. What do I like slash miss the most about it? I'm gonna go with the size and the weight of the bike. The small size of the Rebel meant that I could really get cute with lane splitting and parking. The bike was extremely narrow as a 250cc twin, and it was very low slung as a beginner bike, which means that it was easy to walk through traffic or up curbs and shit, cause y'all know I hop curbs like no tomorrow. The bike weighed just about 300 pounds wet, and most of that weight was in the engine itself. Combine that with the low slung bodywork of the little cruiser, and I could effortlessly lift the bike up from behind even at 19 years old. I actually remember one time when I was out in that battlefield called downtown Brooklyn, that I had parked on Court Street, you know, just to go to the bank. And when I came out, there was this food delivery truck, like I'm talking like a big box truck, parked right next to my bike, which was also between two parked cars in front and in back. The truck was too close to squeeze through and the cars were too close to spin the bike around and then just ride up the sidewalk. The only thing I could do besides wait, which no New Yorker does, is just physically heave hold the bike onto the sidewalk as onlookers watched with respect. I was out of there as cool as when I pulled up, and that wasn't the only time that something like that happened either. The bike also didn't play nice in the winter sometimes, and I found myself running down the street to push start it. And, you know, it's much easier when a bike is only 300 pounds and the engine has very little braking on it. Of course, when you're 200 pounds butt naked on a good day and nearly six foot one, you tend to have to ride a machine that small with your elbows slap boxing your knees and with the suspension bottoming out constantly. I remedied the ergonomic problem by just rotating the bullhorn bars forward in such a way that they actually resembled like mini ape hangers. The longer reach made me have to extend my elbows, making the bike feel a little bit less cramped, and it also looked cooler when the bike was parked. I then put an air seat to help with the suspension. You know, needless to say, I wouldn't want to daily this bike again, but having a small bike like that was nice when space and weight was a matter to consider, which it always is in New York City. Ah uh, yes, the 1999 YZF600R. That's an easy one. Funnily enough, I always liked and I miss how absolutely shitty this bike was. This bike was an absolute wreck, and that made it a bike that I didn't really have to worry much about when I parked it on the street or, you know, took it out. I can't really say that about the bikes that I've owned since. This is basically the bike that earned me my brief title as the Zip Tie King, because not only was the bike held together with more zip ties than a fart can Honda Civic, but I also carried a pack in the trunk just in case something else on the bike decided that it wanted to declare independence. So what was wrong with the bike? Well, the chain tensioner was a zip tie. The rear tire had about two patches in it. The front tire had to be repaired with rubber cement. The rear brake was run down to, well, this, which destroyed the piston and seized the caliper. The swing arm was rusted to hell since they were made of steel back then. The muffler would fall off and skip down the road at times. The fairings were jacked up to the point where the actual fairing stay in front had managed to snap in half 
from high speed bumps. There was that famous rip in the seat, sometimes activating the right turn signal would actually turn on the left which would confuse drivers behind me. The fuel pump went bad which I eventually replaced but I actually rode around on it for a few days because it only spewed gas when it was parked. <laughs> the fairings didn't fit right so they melted against the exhaust. The Speedo had a broken needle somehow, I don't understand how. And the most annoying issue ever, it actually had a bad second gear. Eventually getting to the point where second gear was basically non-existent. But with all that said, I was never afraid to lose it because of all that. I mean, I had this bike all throughout the time that I worked at Target, and unfortunately the one that I worked at didn't have dedicated free parking, which means that the YZF was often outdoors parked on the street until midnight every single day, with just a disc lock, nothing else. But to be honest, I was never worried about it. For one, I never felt like the bike was worth stealing. <laughs> And if they did, well, it's insured anyway, and I hadn't put any money into it to lose. It was a great deal because I was dead broke at the time. Hell, I still kind of am, but I had a pretty reliable source of transportation that wasn't even worth its weight in parts. And when I say reliable, I mean it ran and drove as much as it needed to. Hell, even when it developed a knock or a misfire or whatever the hell it developed, I still rode the bike for like two weeks before I retired it. I took that bike everywhere. In these days, I refrain from riding my bikes to places that require me to park them on the street. But with the YZF, <laughs> forget it, man. Ironically, once I had gotten my SV, they stole the YZF after it was on the street for three weeks straight because the engine had gone bad. Speaking of the SV, more specifically the 2005 Suzuki SV1000S that I owned, the thing I easily missed most about that thing was quite simply the noise that it made. That's it, the noise. See, I've owned two four-cylinder bikes since then, and I like the sounds that they make, but having owned three four-bangers in total, the V-twin engine is something that I would like to rock with again soon. How could you not enjoy this noise? that the SV gave me, that noise would always put a smile on my face without fail. So now I'm running the FZ1, and I know the topic was about bikes that I previously owned, but what I really like about the FZ1 is it's a reliable base for me to potentially modify into something really cool. The problem is that it's pretty much perfect as it is, which is why the plan that I had for it has been left on a back burner for the K100. Remember when I said I was thinking about the topic of, you know, bikes that you sell but then end up missing, and I said it was for several reasons? Well, there's a third reason. See, I've been thinking about the viability of keeping two bikes, or at least keeping two nice bikes, which will become a concern when the K100 is finished. I plan to claim all of the accessories and mods added to the K100 on my insurance, which will, of course, increase my premium. The insurance on the FZ1 isn't super cheap, but the insurance on a mid-80s BMW touring bike it very much is kind of cheap, you know, until I tell them how much money I put into it when it's back onto the road. Now, I don't have plans to sell the FZ1, but I'll be honest, if it comes down to getting rid of one of my bikes, I think I'd have a harder time ridding myself of the BMW for sure. So let's see where this thing goes when it comes to balancing two bikes. But if the pass is any indicator, I already know that either way I'll be looking back thinking like, damn, if only I could keep that bike, you know, whatever that bike happens to be if it happens to be. Because again, my sentimentality tends to butt heads with my pragmatism. <laughs> yeah, I, I probably do have a problem, but then again, what bike it doesn't? Thanks for watching. Have a great weekend.